I've played with, it's that's a tough one. You know, I mean, I got to play with a lot of good players. Um, I like the tough ones like Matty Hilda, um, Ben Cray, um, Isaac De Goyce. But then, you know, like I said, I got to play with guys like Gary Witter, Benji Marshall, Jared Mullen, Code Gidley. Um, you know, it, it, um, I was such, I was in such a great position to get to play with those blokes. But against uh, that's one on one would be Justin Hodges, um, no doubt. I remember one time I tried to um, push and shove him, and he looked at me and said, "Who are you?" And then I just turned around and walked off. So, <laughs> um, yeah, one on one would be Justin Hodges, but to play against someone in the other team was probably Greg Inglis. Yeah, 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 that would be something. Well, so, what, what's the best? That, you know, you've you played you've played all across Australia. What would you say is the best? the best stadium, the best atmosphere that you've played at over there? Oh, I can't go wrong with playing at the night stadium on a Sunday or down at um, Wind Stadium along the beach. I enjoyed both places. Um, and both fans were pretty pretty passionate, so yeah. yeah. I think looking at that time, it was a very tough time, obviously, around the Newcastle point where they were losing quite a few games. But I was looking at the stats and they still they were still getting about 18,000, 19,000 fans at, at the games. Just tell us a bit more about how passionate the fans are in that Newcastle Hunter, Hunter Valley region. Oh, they, they remind me of, you know, back here in England. It's, um, they're, they're a one-town team, a blue-collared town. Um, you know I mean? People go out and work very hard and then they use whatever money they have to come and watch the game in Newcastle. And, um, you know, it's such, a, it's such a proud club, you know, with a lot of rich history. And, um, yeah, like I said, the fans are crazy, you know what I mean? If, you, if you've ever walked around town when a game's on, you'd be the only person, I reckon. So, um, yeah, it's, it's such a great place to, to kickstart or, or even just have a career, career at. And, um, yeah, I recommend it to anyone. And the last question, just to put you on the spot, who would you say your best mate is in Medfield rugby league? Man, I've got, I got too many, to be honest. I've been pretty lucky with, with playing in some good, good teams and good camaraderies. Um, but what I can say is rugby league has given me some best mates, yeah, definitely. Obviously, came after the Newcastle Knights, mate. You mentioned you were previously going to go to the Gold Coast Titans. Was, was there any mention of anywhere else before you came to Lee? Um, well, my last year in Newcastle, I, I told my manager I was going to hang the boots up about six games out. Um, you know, just the process of re-signing there just got to me a, a little bit and um, I didn't want to move again. I was happy with staying at home and just hanging it up and, you know, just, just, just moving on to the next chapter of life and um, I was pretty adamant, yeah, just to give it up. And then I think it was about three games to go. St. Helens come in and um, gave my manager an offer. And uh, we saw, we pretty much agreed to it. They just needed to make a couple moves for that 2018 season. Um, but it couldn't, it, it, um, it wasn't working out for him. So the next plan was to either stay in Newcastle for a year and then come to Saints in 2019. But, um, yeah, like I said, I just wasn't happy with the previous process of my contract, so I didn't want to play at Newcastle anymore, and I uh, decided to hang it up after the World Cup. So how did Lee come about? How did Lee get involved, and, and what attracted you to the sunny shores of Lee? <laughs> um, well, two weeks out, heading over to New Zealand during the World Cup camp, I, um, my manager called me and, and um, said that he got a call from Kieran Cunningham, who... I've had a couple of conversations with in the in the past, um, you know, when he was at Saints, and um, yeah, they gave me a pretty good, pretty good offer. And you know, my wife said to me, if I if I never took it, I'd probably regret it. And you know, um, next thing I knew, after World Cup, I was at a hotel in Sydney meeting Derek Beaumont and Jukesy, and you know, signed the deal. <laughs> So do you think, because we're getting a lot more NRL players over to Super League now, do you think the way it's played is different? Have you had to, have you had to adapt your game in any way? Because I remember, obviously, again, as a Rhinos fan, I remember when James Seguiaro came over and he spoke about sort of how different it is and how, how he felt that the Super League suited his kind of game more. Do you think that, there's, that you suit 
the NRL or the Super League more or, or just the same? Um, for me, both games are different, definitely. Um, but I just had to, I just like to adapt and, and do my best. Um, the toughest thing for me at Lee was I knew basically no players in teams that I, that I played against that year. So it was more of a challenge to myself to try and do my best and, and you know, try and suss out the opposition player as the game went on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the thing about championship is it is the toughest rugby I've played, I've ever played in. Um, you know what I mean? It was, especially when you knew, when you didn't know who not to run at and you run at them, um, that was a pretty tricky one. So, um, yeah, I thought, especially in the start of the year, that championship games was one of the toughest game comps I've ever played in, um, physically, physical wise anyway. Um, but yeah, Super League, it's tough to say. I can't, they like to throw the ball around a lot. Um, and the way, especially the way Cass play, I haven't seen so many forwards as skillful um, as I have before. But what they do have back home is most players are, are very consistent and a lot more athletic from, you know, from the forwards to the, to the backs. But um, yeah, like I said, I think the difference is just the junior systems that we have back home compared to here is what makes you a better player. I think that shows as well in kind of the, the grassroots type of it, especially in the weather over here. If, you know, when I was playing rugby at, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old, if it rained, you didn't play for three months. So you'd miss out on a big chunk of your development. Yet in the NRL, they're getting all these opportunities and it's obviously it's the number one sport over there as well. Do you think the big branding of the NRL and how it is their number one sport, it's almost like their football, what it is over there, over here. Do you think that has a big effect on it too? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, growing up in Australia, the first thing you want to do is play rugby league. Um, where in England, it's football. Um, you know, I couldn't believe in championship teams were changing fixtures just so they could watch Man U play or, or certain things. You know what I mean? That doesn't happen back home. Um, <laughs> rugby league's the number one sport back home. And I think, yeah, it is, it is a big difference. So then you moved to and ended up going to Cass, mate. You obviously had a bit of financial issues at Lee and Cass came in for you. you. You actually debuted with six straight wins and you were kind of firmly settled in at that fullback role. Did, did that fullback role suit you more than maybe a wing or centre position? Uh, fullback's my favourite position. Um, and I was playing, I think after four games at Lee, I ended up playing in a fullback position. So I was, I was pretty used to it by then. Um, you know, a fair bit more running in the Cass, Cass number one jersey, you know, with the way they like to attack. And, um, yeah, it was it was a tough situation. I didn't want to leave, you know. I loved, I loved it at Lee. I enjoyed my time there. And, um, you know, um, but, yeah, it was, it was, it would have been selfish for me to stay. Um, but, yeah, it's, I look back and it's, it was a great decision to come to Cass. I've enjoyed every bit of it and um, it's been fun. Obviously, in that season, you got uh, one game away from Old Trafford to get into the final. And obviously, for, for those boys, that's the biggest place you can go and play. Can you can sum that up, uh, that experience of not getting there for us, please? Yeah, it, it, it hurt, um, especially with Gailey being out most of that season. Um, you know, I won one game off the grand final. We lost to Wigan, who ended up winning it. Um, I went. I actually went and watched that grand final just because, um, you know, I'm pretty close to Bodine Thompson and... He got to play in that Warrington side, so at the same time, I was I was I was happy for him, but I was pretty jealous. So, yeah, it's it's crazy to think that you know one game off the grand final, but hopefully this year we can do it. Definitely, mate. And obviously, in between that was your 2019 season, probably your most consistent season at first grade to date. 31 appearances, three tries, 56 goals, and one drop goal. You know, Cass finished, you actually finished Cass's top point scorer with 121. Was that probably a season to remember for you? Um, yes, oh, I, I, was, I was happy with how it went last year, but at the same time, I, I didn't really get to play much fullback um, just because of the injuries we had. I was changing a lot from centre fullback and, and half, um, which also disrupted how our team wanted to play that year as well. And, um, you know, it's. I got to I got to kick goals for for once in a long time, which is pretty cool again. But you know, thanks to Danny Richardson, I've lost that job. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I said, have you always been a kicker? Oh, when I was younger, I used to kick a fair bit. Um, yeah, I think 2008 was the last time I was goal kicking. So um, it's been a while, and yeah, it was it was a it was a job that I liked. You actually managed to beat Warrington away in the playoffs last season, but then you actually came up against that resilient Salford side, the underdogs who came out of nowhere, and you managed to miss out on Old Trafford again for the second year running. How much motivation does that give you ahead of something like this season in, in getting to Old Trafford again? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think this year is, is a year that we finally, you know, we've been building a, a certain structure to play, and I think this year was a f- we finally got a knockdown, um, especially with Jordan Rankin being at the back. You know, unfortunately, we lost him, um, which is a big loss for us. But, yeah, uh, the, the most disappointing thing about that Salford game is we didn't even play close to our best. Um, you know, we could have took it in a lot easier if we played pretty decent and lost. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, like everyone's seen that, that Salford team done very well last year and they're unlucky not to win. So moving on to this season then, Pete, obviously we've had the disruption with, with the COVID and everything like that and playing in front of no fans. It, does that does that change it? I know from watching at home, it's it's very different with, with no fans and the sort of pumped in crowd noise and stuff. It, is it different there that, that you can't sort of feel the energy from from the crowd? Yeah, it was it was tough to take because, you know, we, we were on a roll on before this COVID-19 and um, you know, our, our team was was healthy for once in the past three years. So, uh, but yeah, it's without fans. It, you know, you do like your fans because you know I really believe that they do get you over over the line sometimes. And especially at the jungle, no one wants to play us at the jungle, and and we love we love playing there. And and I really miss the fans um, at the jungle. So hopefully they can um, get out soon and, and support us, and we get to play in front of them. Obviously, you mentioned probably your main aim this season, mate, is, is aiming towards that grand final. Do you, do you think you're having what it takes in the squad now with, with additions like Danny Richardson and Gareth O'Brien who you've just signed as well? Yeah, well, we've got to give um, Gaz O'Brien some time. Um, but, yeah, no doubt. I, I definitely believe we're a top three team. Um, I'm not saying that with cockiness, just just saying that with, um, with confidence. I think, like I said, the past three years we've been building a certain structure and I think we've finally got a knockdown. Um, hopefully we can get Gaz O'Brien up to it as quick as we can but yeah, whoever wins it this year it's going to be the best the best and toughest season to win it in history I reckon um, just with you know, the modified rounds, the huge disruptions training and playing restrictions and like you said, no crowds it's going to be the toughest season to win in history I reckon. Uh, just moving on from Rugby Pete and obviously I don't know if people know you do a lot of motivational speaking and obviously the blueprint. Can you tell us obviously how you came into doing that? Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, um, well, I love speaking and communication is a dynamic process and how you communicate can positive, positively and negatively affect um, the interaction that you have with others. Um, you know, for me, it's a privilege to speak and communicate. You know, when um, people come and ask me to come and talk to them, you know, I feel like I feel like it's, um, you know, I get the same feeling I do when I'm waiting in the tunnels to, to run out and play a game, you know what I mean? They they ask you to come and speak because they value what I say and, you know, um, for someone, you know, to, you know, it's because they feel what I have to say is, is pretty valuable and I could be that person when, you know, when I say something, I could change a certain decision or or, or someone's choice of, of, of life and, um, you know, if what I've been through and, and what I've overcome, I feel like my story, um, and my story can can help someone. You know, it could be someone's blueprint to to overcome what they're going through, or or to their you know survival guide kind of thing. And yeah, like I said, I, I enjoy talking, and hopefully, the more I share my stories, I can give somebody the chance to to um, you know overcome what they're going through. I think it sounds like, mate, that you've obviously got a great story behind you. Obviously, a bit coming at such a young age, having to almost be the father of your family and, and coming through adversity, playing rugby league, having obviously a crushed voice box and stuff. Is, is motivational speaking something you want to do far into the future after rugby league? Yeah, definitely. That's something I'd like to do after rugby league. Um, you know, like you said, with those two things, on top of, you know, my son um, having a tumour 
a year ago, you know, I'm 